Okay, welcome back Chemistry 111 guys. We have our last hourly exam before the final exam. So I've got a set of practice problems here that I hope will help you build your confidence and uh, get a little bit of review uh, in before you, you take that last exam. I know, you know, things are kind of tough on campus with COVID and everything, but you got to really stay focused because this will be a challenging exam just because of the material. Uh, and you got to be able to know both the definitions and how to explain things and compare and contrast things in addition to doing the calculations. So we're going to go ahead and jump in, do some of these, and hopefully answer some questions. Uh, don't forget that we've got a review uh, Q&A session on Zoom, and then you also have SI and the QSC at your disposal, so you have lots of support, so please don't wait till the last minute. Okay, jumping into this first one, let's turn on the pen here and see if we can get going. Um, this one is basically just essentially a bunch of, of definition questions. Uh, you know, a little bit of compare and contrast, but here it says, what is a state function, right? If you don't know what a state function is by now, we've had thermodynamics in previous exams. State function is really what? It's basically a function where all you really care about, right? Now, I know this question says a few complete sentences, but for the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna kinda talk about these and you can put them into your own statements and consult your textbook if you need to review after this. But anyway, state function, right, what is it? It means that it only cares about what? It only cares about where you start and where you end, right? State functions only care about your what? They only care about the initial and the final state. That's where the term comes from. So typically, things like, you know, uh, delta H, that's a really good state function. That's basically going to be equal to the enthalpy of the final state minus the entropy of the initial or the enthalpy of the initial state and this works for things like free energy and entropy as well and free energy right we've talked about four really important state functions in this class that's really important what state functions do not care about is they don't care about how you get right they don't care about how you get from the initial to the final so we call this what we don't care about the path so we call this path independent right path independent we don't care how you get from the initial to the final. We can take any path that doesn't matter if we do it in lab, if it's done in a cell, if it's done in nature, it doesn't matter. As long as we can find a way to get from initial to final, we get the same answer as if we took any other path. That's really important. All right, the second one, second law of thermodynamics. You need to know the three laws of thermodynamics, really important. The first one is conservation of energy. The third one was basically the absolute definition of entropy, and the second one is really important because it says basically what? It says for any spontaneous, right, any spontaneous process, what is that going to tell you? It means that if a spontaneous process is um, identified, that means that the overall change in entropy, right, for the universe has to be what? It has to be greater than zero, which means it has to be a positive. And remember the change in entropy entropy for the universe is composed of two components the change in entropy for the system plus don't forget the change in entropy for the surroundings right so that's really important you have to look at both and that's why this is kind of complicated and, and and this gives rise to the idea of why we typically use Gibbs free energy as opposed to just entropy because Gibbs free energy gives you the idea of just a system perspective for spontaneity but if you just look at the second law for what it is it only tells you that for a spontaneous process the entropy of the universe has to be increasing or you can say the sign has to be positive same thing all right next two we got here um, it says what is meant by the term for energy well I just talked about Gibbs free energy right we talked about Delta G and oftentimes we think about Delta G for a reaction so if we have a reaction a going to B, I don't care, you can make up whatever reaction you have, and you get a value, right? And let's say that value is something like negative 33 kilojoules. Well, what does that mean? It means that this reaction, by looking at the sign, it's negative, so that means this is a spontaneous reaction. If it's spontaneous, this reaction can generate up to 33 kilojoules that is free, right, the word free, to do useful work. And what does that mean? It could be used to push electrons in a battery. It could be used to uh, make another reaction go that's not spontaneous, all kinds of things. It just really means that at most, uh, you know, theoretically you could harness the 33 kilojoules of energy uh, produced from this reaction to do other things that are useful. So the energy that is free to do useful work is what is termed uh, free energy. However, if it was a positive, right, if we were to go backwards, right, it would be a positive 33 
kilojoules and in this case this does not generate free energy and in fact in this case we have to put energy in to make this process go because it is not spontaneous right positive delta G's are not spontaneous last one here explain what is meant by supercritical fluid well remember you have a you know phase diagram where you have pressure on one axis and temperature on the other and you typically have you know you have your you know diagram like this where you've got you know solid liquid gas um, and so you know what happens here well you say okay well at some point over here is the critical point right and beyond the critical point if you're in this region over here you kind of blur the distinction between liquid and gas and that's really important so a supercritical fluid is really this kind of neat phase of matter where it has properties akin to both a liquid and a gas uh, really quite unique and, and that's discussed quite a bit in your book so make sure to to go back and review that so real quick answers there I hope that that helps you out this one below is sort of a review problem talking about Hess's law right and so how do you take we want we do not know the Delta H uh, formation uh, this is the standard Delta H formation will not sign right there uh, we want this reaction here and and we want to we don't know it but since Delta H is a state function if we don't, don't know it directly we can actually go through this path of multiple reactions add them all up and we'll be just fine and get the same answer so if you think about this the way I kind of approach this say okay what do I do here I know I need two borons on the reactant side okay if I know that I can look at my reaction and say okay well here's boron as a reactant so that's good I don't have to flip the reaction it's on the right side it's a uh, in this case on the left side right it's a reactant I don't need four I need two so that means I need to basically divide this by two uh, divide this by two and divide that by two and then in order to get the right number I take this value and do what I'm gonna take that value and I'm gonna divide it by two so that's not so hard and if I do that I can go ahead and begin to build build a tally here right I can bring this guy down and I can say what do I got here I got negative two thousand five hundred forty six divided by two and I get uh, negative right don't forget your sign that's really important don't lose track of that I get 1273 kilojoules by just dividing that by two why is that because I divided the whole reaction by two remember enthalpy is depending on how much stuff you have it's an extensive property right so if I've got half as much reaction I only get half as much uh, heat released in this case it's an exothermic right and it's probably worth you know noting that all three of these right are exothermic because they're all negatives that's really important to point out okay I got my boron taken care of that's good now I need to my hydrogens here and so if I look at my hydrogens the only place I have hydrogen is right here in the second one well that's convenient but unfortunately I don't have enough so I need to actually multiply this one right I need to multiply this by three so I can multiply by three multiply by three multiply by three and I'm gonna take that one and multiply by three if I do that I think I get what I get negative you know kind of bringing this one down and I get negative eight hundred and fifty eight right negative five eight five eight kilojoules there we go and then the last one right I need one mole of this product I don't see it anywhere on the product side I see it over here which means it's on the wrong side I need to reverse it I need to flip this arrow to this direction the way I do that is to multiply the whole thing by a negative one so I multiply by negative one when that comes down it becomes a positive because we just flipped the sign and if I add all those up if I you know if I were to take these and add them all up you would get this answer up here prove it to yourself make sure you can do that I'm not going to do that for you here I can add it all up and I think I get about positive 35 I think um, in this case yeah that's correct number of sig figs because I'm doing addition and so there you go 35 kilojoules that is the heat of formation standard heat of formation for this diborane chemical right here so there you go and and I should be more more careful right because this is a little thing I'm not gonna really yell at you for doing this but heats of formation right this is a Delta H of formation at standard conditions you should know by now just by looking up those tables you're making one mole of this right so it's gonna be kilojoules per one mole of what per mole of diborane that's it's a little thing but I think it's important to do things right so we're gonna pay attention there so there you go now you might say well, wait a minute why aren't these Delta H's 
um, kilojoules per mole. Well, they're different. Those are just delta H's of reaction, standard delta H of reaction. This is a heat of formation. Heats of formation have a very uh, particular definition, right? Heats of formation tell you that it is the heat released or absorbed when you form literally one mole, one mole of product from its elements in their standard states. And so that's that's really important. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. We've got a lot to cover. This next one I think is pretty easy, but really important. This one says, okay, well I've got this reaction and you see here the equilibrium arrows, right? So you gotta pay attention to equilibrium. You're given an equilibrium constant and that constant is at room temperature. So as long as we keep the temperature constant, we're good there. And it says, does a reaction stop once it reaches equilibrium? Well, remember this is what? This is dynamic, right? This is dynamic equilibrium, which means that the reaction doesn't stop. However, the rate of the forward reaction is gonna be equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, right? And if that happens, if the rates are the same, you see net, no net change because the concentrations won't change once you reach equilibrium because you're making equal amount of product as your decomposing product and you're making equal amount of reactant as you decompose reactant. So they cancel each other out. And I think that's really important. Remember, equilibrium says there's no net change, but dynamic equilibrium tells you that the reactions are still going on. It's just that their rates have equalized and there's no net change overall in what you measure. The expression for the equilibrium constant for concentration, Kc, is pretty simple. We can look at this and we can say we take the products, right? SO3, now we want the equilibrium concentration squared because there's a two there, don't forget that. And then we're gonna take the uh, SO2 molar concentration, that's what the little brackets stand for. Looks like there's a two there, so we gotta be careful about that. And then finally, the O2 concentration, we don't have to worry about a, a coefficient because it's one. You don't Anything raised to one is itself, so you don't need to put a one there. If it makes you feel better, go ahead. Now remember, this is the equilibrium constant expression, but it's also the same mathematical expression as Q, except they're not at equilibrium. So we can solve this in a very similar way for part C here. We can write it out. Concentration of SO3 squared all over the concentration of SO2 squared times O2. Now remember, if you're doing equilibrium, you need to tell me it's equilibrium because Q is not at equilibrium. Q can be any time. And if we crank those out, these were given to you, right? You gotta make sure to write the right ones in the right box. So we'll say 1.50 molar uh, cubed over, what is this? 2.5 molar uh, squared, sorry, squared. And then finally times, what is it? 2.50 molar uh, just raised to the one. If you crank that out really quickly, um, what do you get? I got something like, let's see, this is gonna be three sig fig, so I'm gonna go zero because it's multiplication and division. So it's gonna be 0 0.144, there you go. And we didn't really talk about this a whole lot, but equilibrium constants and Qs, you don't have to worry about the units because of, um, there are more uh, esoteric uh, things behind it, but just know that Qs do not have units, their ratios. I know sometimes the molars don't cancel out, but for right now, this is probably one of the only times, except for pH, where you don't put a unit on there. That's, that's really important. And the last one says, we need to explain, am I at equilibrium? Well, if you look at it, the Q is equal to 0 0.144. You just calculated that up above, and we can compare that to K which was given to us in the problem above, which is 0 0.281. And in this case, you say, okay, hold on, hold on. Um, I've got 0.144 and 0.281. Well, it looks like the K is bigger, right? If K is bigger than Q, we are not at equilibrium because you're only at equilibrium when they are the exact same numbers. Um, and so if Q is smaller, the way you get smaller is by having less product than you need. Or you can say you have more reactants than you need. So it will shift to equilibrium by going to products because it is too small. So in order to make Q bigger, you have to make more product until Q equals K, and then you know you're at equilibrium. So that's really important. Last one on this page. Um, let's see here. It says 
We want to maximize the amount of hydrogen gas produced, so that's really important. We want to maximize that product. It's kind of like working in a factory or a chemical plant where you want to make the most of something. And so what can we do, remember, using Le Chatelier? Well, one thing you need to do right away, I think, right away is say, okay, I can see this is an endothermic reaction from the problem. It tells us that. So in this case, I'll write positive delta H for reaction. That's really important. So if that's the case, if this uh, chemical reaction absorbs heat, I'm going to go ahead and add heat as a reactant. If it were exothermic, you would add heat as a product. Pretty simple. And so now we're going to say, what can we do? If we add water, right, if we add some water, what does that do? Well, that's going to shift us to product. So you want to add water, and that will uh, allow you to uh, shift, right, shift to um, products. And if that's the case, we're going to get more H2. So that's good. Carbon, if we add carbon, you might be tempted to say it does the same thing. But remember, that's a solid. In this case, it has no effect. Because there is no effect of carbon, the solid, in the equilibrium because it is not part of the equilibrium expression. Solids and pure liquids are not included. So you got to make sure you're, you're aware of that. In this case, we can say um, increasing or decreasing pressure. Well, remember, pressure deals with moles of gas. On the reactant side, I have one mole of gas. On the product side, I have two. So in this case, you'd want to do what? You'd want to, in, you want to, if you, well, if you're tempted to say increase, what's going to happen? When you increase pressure, it goes to the lowest number of moles. So if you increase, that's going to go the wrong way. That's going to go to reactant. You don't want that. You want to decrease the pressure so it shifts to products because decreasing the pressure will shift it to the higher number of moles and in this case the higher number of moles is on the product side so yes we definitely want to decrease the pressure and then finally increasing or decreasing temperature well that's why we did that little analysis at the beginning heat is a, a reactant so we want to uh, add more energy in the form of heat so by adding heat it will shift to products and we will get more hydrogen gas now again you need to be careful and explain your answer where I can read it. You can't just, you know, what I just did here is for sake of example to kind of walk you through what's going on and to keep the video short. But if you just kind of write this, these little short answers, you're not going to get full credit. Make sure to explain things. And when I say explain them, walk me through it. Say, okay, for example, for water, you would say water is a reactant. If I add more reactant, Le Chatelier says it will shift to products. If it shifts to products, I generate more H2, and that's what I want. Be able to give that kind of explanation. You gotta, you know, work for full credit. It's not just gonna be given to you. Okay, moving on to the next page. I'm trying to make good time here because I know you got a lot of things going on in your life, and I want to make sure uh, I don't waste your time. This next one is really kind of a neat application of colligative properties, right? In this case, we have to know the equation, and the equation is the delta T, right? The change in either the boiling point or the freezing point. In this case, we're talking about the, uh, uh, let's see, we're talking about the uh, freezing point. So you can say TF, and that's going to be equal to what? That's going to be equal to the little m, right? Molality, that's really important, times the KF times the Van Toff factor. Now what's really cool here is that it tells you this is a molecular material. It's a non-electrolyte, so it will not break up. So you can then get rid of I because I is equal to one. Really, really easy there. And so we can plug things in now. We can see that the, the delta T is given, so 5.94. Remember, this is the absolute value. You can't have a negative molarity, so be careful about that. And then we don't know the molarity, right? I'm sorry, the molality, excuse me. I'm getting a little bit sleepy here. Uh, molality, right? Little m, I just said that. Little. I'm going to write it over here so I don't forget. This is molality, right? This is important. And this is going to be equal to, right? This is moles of, in this case, uh, cyclohexane. But we'll just say uh, solute, right? Over, this is really important, kilograms of solvent. And in this case, camphor is a solvent. So we can just, we don't know the moles, so I'm going to go ahead and leave this as moles uh, solute. However, we do know the amount of camphor, right? And we can take 100, or we can take 10 grams, we can divide it by 1,000, and we get kilograms, so we can put this down here. Again, this problem is all about taking what you know and filling in the things that you have from the problem. 
And so we can do that, and it's going to be, I think, three sig figs. So there you go. Kilograms of solvent. I'm going to put that in a big old parenthetical. And then the KF is given to us 40.0 degrees C per molal. And now, if you think about it right, we can just take this, divide by 40, multiply by uh, the kilograms here, and I get something like 0 0.0014937. It's going to be moles of cyclohexane. I'm just going to call it CH. And I need to tell you when I make an abbreviation, so I'm going to call that CH just as an abbreviation. And that equals, um, in this case, that's how many moles, right? We just solve for moles. Now we know that, ah, check it out. We know the grams of that. So that's equal to 0 0.1250 grams of cyclohexane. So if you think about it, molar mass, right, is grams per mole. So if you take the grams divided by mole, you end up getting... What did I get here? I got 84.2 grams per mole cyclohexane. That's not that hard, but you really need to think about what things are. If you don't know the definitions, you're never going to get this. This number six here relates to osmotic pressure. Remember, osmotic pressure goes up based on molarity. Uh, remember, right, basically, osmotic pressure is this guy. Uh, molarity times the gas constant times temperature times the Van't Hoff factor. The, everything here is constant except for the Van't Hoff factor. So we have to look at these and say, okay, HF is a, is a weak electrolyte. It only breaks up very, very tiny amounts. So the Van't Hoff factor is gonna be really small, like one. And if you forget what the Van't Hoff factor is, go read your textbook. Don't be lazy, okay? Um, in this case, so this, this I would be, uh, ooh, not T, sorry. I is a, about one. In this case, lithium chloride, that is a soluble salt. So it's going to break up into two very distinct things. So its Van't Hoff factor is going to be equal to two. And now barium acetate, it's going to break up into three very distinct things because it is a soluble salt. So I is equal to three. So now we can rank them because the lowest one is going to be HF. The next one's going to be lithium chloride. And the highest is going to be the barium acetate. This next one uh, is kind of a trickier one, but I think you can solve it. In this case, we have a reaction of dissolution of silver chloride. So what does that mean? It means we have silver chloride, right? And that's a solid. And we're going to uh, dissolve some of it. It's an it's a insoluble salt, but a little bit's going to go into solution. And that's going to give us uh, silver plus, And it's going to give us chloride minus. And in this case, you can say, well, what's going on here? Is it very soluble? No, because look at the K. The K is tiny. Right? This is not a soluble salt because the K is so small. And so what we can do now is we can say the KC is going to be equal to what? Well, we can say it's equal to the uh, silver plus at equilibrium raised to the 1. We don't have to worry about that. The chloride concentration at equilibrium raised to the 1. And this is equal to 1.7 times 10 to the negative 10. Really easy. And if you look at this, Silver and chloride are one to one. So we can say, okay, well, we don't know this number, so we'll call it x. Since it's one to one, we'll call this x. So this is equal to x squared. So basically x, which is equal to the concentration of silver at equilibrium, is equal to the square root of Kc. And in this case, I think I got 1.3 times 10 to the negative fifth molar. Pretty, pretty easy if you just think about the definition. It's not that hard. All right, this next one I think is really good because it really talks about kind of uh, thinking about if you know what equilibrium really is. And so here you have an unfortunate situation where you have hemoglobin, which is one of the proteins in your blood, and you can react it with carbon monoxide, unfortunately, if you get that in your house or in uh, a situation like a garage where a car is running with a closed door, that's a terrible thing. And it will bind and you can asphyxiate uh, and die, which is terrible. And so let's think about what this looks at. like. We've got one hemoglobin for every four carbon monoxides. And you can see here what's going on. So I'm going to say initially, let's say I have zero of this guy first. So I'll put this one down here. And I'm going to put, uh, you know, I'll put my uh, HbCO4 uh, here. And then I'm going to say up here, I'm going to say, I don't know, let's say I've got um, 
initially I've got a bunch of hemoglobin and we'll say down here I've got a little bit of carbon monoxide again I didn't give you numbers so you can kind of do whatever you want to the moment the reaction starts you're gonna to start to form some hemoglobin complex right and then eventually oh man that's that's terrible looking I, I don't like that at all okay okay let's see if I can do this again there you go it's gonna kind of level off and at the same time it's one-to-one -one versus hemoglobin as this is produced hemoglobin has to be removed there you go now those are one to one but if you look at the carbon dioxide that's four times as much because you have to use four of those for every one hemoglobin so this is going to be a much uh, steeper slope and then finally you get the idea here it's going to level off and the moment you kind of get to this range here you know you've reached equilibrium and so this is just like we talked about in the notes how do you know uh, you know uh, when it's reached equilibrium when there's no net change right and then you say okay what are the relative initial rates well you look at the stoichiometric coefficients hemoglobin and the hemoglobin complex are one to one so they have the same rates but the carbon monoxide that's four times so that's gonna be a much steeper rate than the other ones and then finally once you get the equilibrium the reaction doesn't stop it's dynamic it goes back and forth but you know at this point I hope that the rates forward equal the rates reverse and so you see no net change and that's why the the lines the concentrations kind of look flat over time all right almost there last page trying to keep this one short for you guys now oops we're not the last page sorry second to last page okay so this next one is another kind of answer things with complete sentences I'm just gonna kind of mention them briefly and give you some notes which intermolecular force is the strongest? We talked about this by far. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest, right? It is strong because of the way you have the polarization of the uh, H bond, right? And that has to be, you have to have an H bound, right? H bound to what? To a um, nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. And so if you have something like, uh, water is a really good example, right? You have water here you know that oxygen is a lot more electronegative it's it's polar but really polar and so this guy becomes partial negative this guy becomes partial positive and that unequal sharing of those electrons really makes that 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 polar bond even more polar than you might imagine and so when it finds similar structures it's gonna bind really really tightly much more than uh, dispersion forces and even more than regular dipoles these are kind of like super dipoles and that's why hydrogen bonding is really really strong the vapor pressure of water decreases when salt is added well if you think about it right if you've got a, a beaker and you've got some water in it and these water molecules some of them will actually you know escape into a gas right gas water liquid water right and, and if you think about it just naturally in order to form a gas they have to break what they have to break the H bonds the hydrogen bonding we just talked about and so that can happen sure um, but if you add salt into it what do you form if you add salt you're adding sodium ions and you're adding chloride ions you're now going to form those ion dipole interactions that we talked about so you're adding more intermolecular forces actually pretty strong ones and so what that does is it kind of traps more water in the liquid state because they have to break not only the hydrogen bonds but they have to break the ion dipoles to escape and become part of the gas and if you have to break more of these it's going to take more thermal energy or if you don't have extra thermal energy just less of the water molecules are going to escape and if less of the water molecules escape you will not have as uh, strong or a, a high of a vapor pressure and so overall if you have water and you've got a vapor pressure set up and you add salt into it less molecules are going to escape and so that vapor pressure is going to decrease based on the addition of more intermolecular forces these next two are pretty simple uh, this one here says uh, energy is released when a chemical bond is broken that is absolutely not true that is false because if I have a nice stable bond like HH or you know something even stronger like a triple bond nitrogen that is a stable molecule for the most part and if you want to disrupt that if you want to pull those apart right if you want to break that apart you're gonna to have to put some energy in to make that happen you're essentially gonna to have to rip that apart if you're gonna do that that's gonna require you to add energy energy is not released 
energy must be absorbed to break bonds. So it's basically the opposite. It's a very common misconception. A lot of people get this wrong, so please don't be one of those people. This next one says, take a look at this reaction and estimate if it's gonna be positive, negative, or no change for the entropy. Give a couple answers. Well, this is pretty easy. One, you can look at it and you can say, this is a, a decomposition reaction, right? This is a decomposition reaction and decomposition increases uh, disorder, right? You gotta talk about what entropy is, it's disorder. So that means it's gonna be a positive delta S of reaction. So that's one answer. The other one I think that's more detailed is you're going from uh, zero moles of gas to what? You're going, let's see, that's a solid, that's a liquid. Oh, now we got three moles of gas on this side. So if you're creating more gas, that is definitely more disorder. So if you have more disorder, again, that's going to be a positive delta S of reaction. Things like we talked about in class and in your book. There we go. This last one is kind of similar to the one we saw on a previous uh, page where uh, we want to come up with the overall equilibrium constant. And you have to remember, equilibrium constants play by different mathematical rules than enthalpy or entropy or delta G. And so make sure you go back to your notes, read your book. The rules are different. And I'm going to try to show you that right here. So this is the reaction we want down here. So if we think about this, I've got this sodium oxide as my reactant. I see sodium oxide as my reactant here, but I need two of them. So I'm gonna to have to multiply this whole reaction um, by two. You'll be tempted to multiply the equilibrium constant by two, but that's not the case. Uh, in this case, you have to raise it to the power of two, and that's really important. So don't forget about that. There, these are different mathematical rules. And then this one, I've got my product, but my product's on the wrong side, so I need to flip this reaction. If I flip this reaction, I don't multiply it by anything. I basically take the inverse because if you think about what the equilibrium constant is, I am flipping reactants and products. So it's going to flip the inverse of my um, equilibrium constant. So it's one over the equilibrium constant. So the new equilibrium constant is going to be equilibrium constant one, right? From reaction, I'll call this one, I'll call this one two, squared. And then. Um, this one here, we will say it's one over equilibrium constant. Uh, I'll just put two uh, notches on it. And then when you get that, I think I get something like 8.02 sig figs here times 10 to the 18. Because if you're dividing by negative 29, the number is going to get pretty big. And there you go. That's pretty simple. Okay. Now for reals for reals, last page. And this one won't take us too long. I think it's pretty simple. This one is really simple, right? It's basically trying to calculate the heat of reaction, the standard heat of reaction. So we're gonna use the products minus reactants. I'm not gonna do all the calculations for you, but you can kind of look at this and say, okay, there are four, uh, four moles of NO gas, right? Uh, make sure you know it's gas. I'm not gonna write everything here, um, but you know, you have to make sure you match the ones up in the table to what's actually there, because gases and liquids have different values. And in this case, if I have four moles of that NO, nitrogen monoxide, it is, in this case, that is a positive value, 91.3 kilojoules per mole. Always pay attention to your units. The moles will cancel. I'm going to add that because I'm taking all my products. I've got to get my six moles of water. And in this case, that water is in the gas form. And if I look from the table, it's negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. I'm going to add all those up and then I'm going to minus the reactants, right? And in the case I've got uh, four moles of ammonia, right? Gas ammonia, right? And so that's going to be negative 45.9 kilojoules per mole. And the oxygen, you don't see it on the table because for Enthalpy, right? This is a relative scale. The elements in their standard states don't, uh, they are not included because they are zeros, right? So if you wanted to, you could add it here. Uh, you could add this and it's zero. Um, and so now you, you take the products minus the reactants and I got something like negative 902 kilojoules. 
and that is exothermic, right? So it's negative delta H for that reaction. That's really critical because we're going to need it later on. The next one says predict uh, the sign of delta S, right, for the entropy. And here we have what? We've got, uh, it looks like we've got nine moles of gas, right, going to four plus six is ten moles of gas. So we've created one extra mole of gas, which means that is going to be increasing the disorder. So that means it's a positive delta S of that reaction. So we got an exothermic reaction and we've got a increase in entropy. So here this last question asks you to figure out is it going to be spontaneous? Well you have to think about spontaneity in terms of delta G, the free energy, and that is equal to delta H of the reaction. And I'm going to put a little negative here because it was exothermic minus T, remember T is Kelvin, cannot be negative, times delta S of the reaction. And that was a positive, right? Because it increases disorder. And in this case, you say, okay, um, I want delta G to be spontaneous. And so if it's spontaneous, if delta G is negative, delta H being negative helps me get there. That's good, so that's helping me. It's driven by enthalpy to be spontaneous. And it's increasing disorder, so positive times a negative is a negative, right? So that adds more negative, so entropy is helping me. And I know that T cannot be lower than zero, so guess what? There is no temperature I can pick that will make this reaction non-spontaneous because both enthalpy and entropy are helping me go to negative. So it is spontaneous at all temperatures. There we go. I hope this has helped you. Um, tried to keep this video short, but fill it full of information. Like I said, if you have questions, let me know. Come to the review session on Zoom. And just really, I mean, I urge you, thermodynamics is not easy. You're gonna have to work really hard on this. So do not leave this till the last minute. You've got to study and you've got to study hard because um, you know this exam has a lot of challenging material on it. I think a lot of you are just getting tired and worn out as the semester goes along. This is not the time to give up. You got to kind of, you know, dig deep, be strong, and, and finish as best you can to earn the highest grade that, that you possibly can. So, um, you know, expect problems that are. Uh, reminiscent of the types that you've been asked either in this handout or in class or in the textbook or on your homework um, you know I hope there are no surprises but you know you gotta review your notes because there are times where I said things are really important and I'm gonna hold you accountable to knowing those really important things okay have a good one stay strong and I'll see you soon